Um, I want to welcome you all uh, to another meeting with the Facility Needs Assessment Committee, and this is a group of thought leaders from across our district, which covers 171 perimeter miles of Albion and Marshall. Um, and most of you have been at this table for quite some time, so I appreciate the, again, the energy and the enthusiasm and the questions and concerns that you brought to us. Um, one of the things we like to address is just give you an update on the schooling. Um, uh, we did meet with the board on Monday and we uh, identified four dates in the month of January to do some board focused and open forums where community members can join in in that discussion based on the lead um, and recommendations that come from the committee um, as they struggle through how to prioritize as well um, after hearing from you as a, as a committee. Um, we'll get those dates at the end so that you know when those are and what times they're meeting. And we were gonna get that as, as, as Becky said, that's already gonna be published and we're gonna make sure that we get the word out with that. Um, COVID-19 and its impact on our schools. Just to give you a quick update, there's a, there's a new um, format matrix that came out in, um, um, basically how to determine uh, spread or internal um, commit, uh, transmission of COVID within the school system and what the risks are for that. Um, our county health department in Calhoun is, is, is adopting that. They're, they're going to use that and communicate with us on a weekly basis what our county um, cases of, or incidences of COVID positive per 100,000 is which is different than the state, which is per 1 million. They're also going to look at our uh, positivity rates of uh, COVID-19 new cases um, over a seven day period of time. And that uh, is again, different than what the state represents. And then we're going to look at specifically for our district and every district in Calhoun County, he's going to give us a report of um, incidences per 100,000 for our district relative to the county for comparison. Um, long story short, last week, from Wednesday to this Wednesday, we were under a highest risk category uh, based on the incidences of uh, one per 100,000, both in the county. Uh, we are also at the highest risk because we're 14% uh, of new cases for a seven day period of time and anything over 10% is considered the highest risk. And then when you look at our own district, we were over 100 um, higher on incident per 100,000 than the county was. So that, again, that puts us at highest risk. We were actually 152 um, over that. The new data came out today by the county. They give it to us on a weekly basis. And even though our positivity rate has gone down to 10.4%, it's still above 10%. And our, um, and our uh, incidences per 100,000 at the county level went down a little bit. Our own um, uh, difference was still ab above 100, higher than what the county is. So we're still considered highest risk uh, from now until um, next Wednesday. And um, all that basically does is give us guidance on do we continue to do virtual for especially our, our high school? Do we continue to only bring in person for our high needs kids at the middle school? And then do we have to um, change or improve or increase what we're doing for mitigation at the elementary school if we're doing in person? Um, there's a lot of moving parts as you well are well aware by now. Uh, right now we're at virtual only for the whole entire district until we get to um, um, through the holiday. Right now, we're scheduled to be virtual only for the entire district until the 19th of January, the day after Dr. Martin Luther King Day. Um, however, we're going to continue to look at the data and, um, and possibly consider restarting our, our in-person um, hybrid models um, at a different time than the 19th, possibly on January 11th. But there's a lot of dialogue that needs to go on about that and, and uh, that has to be um, vetted with the um, teachers union as well. So just want you to know there's a lot of moving parts. We're trying to do the best we can. Our parents are, are, are really, you know, 
Uh, the kindergarten through fifth grade is the least risk population that we have based on our own data internally to the district as well as what the field says. And um, we're hoping to get our, our kids, our little kids especially back in school. Um, we'll see how that goes, but just pay, pay attention to those, those changes as we move forward. Um, Richard, you wanna introduce um, Dr. Johnson for um, his segment here? Yes, sir. Um, I just I wanted to just uh, harken back because we've got a couple people on this call that have been involved with this process for a while. Um, and, when, and when I say process, I'm talking about Marshall and Albion together. And I'm remembering a meeting that Dr. Bonner was at probably six years ago uh, when he talked about trying to create something unique and something special as an educational institution in Albion and what that would look like going a long way down the road, um, but I've, one thing that I've, I've sort of been missing with these conversations is a vision for what we're going to do in Albion, and we had a, uh, Shauna and Amanda and I had a conversation with Dr. Johnson, um, actually, I should say, Sean initially invited him to a board meeting, and he started to lay out this, this vision for, for Washington Gardner, and then we heard some more about it, and, you know, I apologize for all the protocol and timing, but I, I felt like we needed to hear this. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of pieces that we've been talking about. I'm not gonna steal his thunder, but I, I thought it made sense when we're talking about this elementary to hear what Dr. Johnson had to say. So I'm, I'm really pleased he's able to join us and I'm looking, I hope he's still here, but Dr. Johnson, please, please take it away. Yeah, I'm still here, Richard. Okay. You can't get rid of me that easy. <laughs> I'm scrolling through my pictures looking for you. So. <laughs> There's a lot of folks here. Great. Well, thanks for the time uh, this, this evening. I'm going to spend just a few minutes uh, sharing some ideas I have. Um, I recognize they are ideas of a newcomer um, and of someone who has not necessarily been in the community that long. Nevertheless, um, as I have been here for a bit, I've started to recognize some needs in, in our community here in Albion and some ways that the college wants to uh, partner. And so you may have heard uh, in the news recently that we have partnered with the YMCA uh, on uh, recreation here in Albion uh, and are partnering with the YMCA to begin thinking through uh, as a partnership, the Washington Gardner Redevelopment Project that we've been working on for a while. Um, I shared with the board uh, earlier in the year a vision for Washington Gardner that would become an integrated arts facility for our art, music, and theater departments with a, an athletic arena behind it in the space that used to be the playground or, or parking lot. Uh, that addresses several issues for the college in terms of our needs, but we wanted to do it in a way that uh, involves the community. And so we're really happy that the YMCA has come along as a partner with us in that. We also will be having um, space in that building for community programs, uh, after school and weekend programming provided by the college for, for kids in this community, uh, and a variety of other uh, initiatives and elements in the building. It's, it's quite a large and magnificent building. Um, as I heard about the potential bond issue though, I started to think about what would it mean for us to come to the school district and say, is there a way that we might um, partner on a future school in this community as well? Um, I have seen some of the materials uh, that have been distributed around what the bond might cover. And I have noticed that there is an elementary school named in that, in that list of possibilities for the future. So, um, so here's the idea and uh, we're pretty passionate about it. Uh, it would be great to think about an elementary school located uh, at the Washington Gardner property we have a property adjacent to it in the Munger facility and behind the Munger facility. We, we've already been talking with the city about closing some streets that uh, bisect property that we own internal to campus. We, would, we could add that, that street to the, to the conversation as well to create more space. There's also a five house uh, plot of land between the school and the ground field in the back that could also be acquired um, moving forward to expand the lot uh, to create enough space for an elementary school addition on what we are planning. 
So what I'm proposing is a facility that would be a YMCA, an uh, integrated arts facility, community programming, GSRP classrooms, and a STEAM elementary school. Imagine if all 350 children in the building had two college student mentors for their time in the building. And we could do that uh, as a partnership, uh, linking it to our work here at the college. Right next door is the health clinic, of course, in Munger. Uh, and soon uh, there will be additional tenants in Munger that provide additional health uh, services in the community. And down the street, we are working towards potentially relocating the food distribution program here in Albion into the basement of Wesley Hall, where some of you may remember there was once a cafeteria that we will uh, attempt to resurrect and have a community feeding site, a community kitchen uh, for folks to access a pantry, but also have a community meal uh, on a regular basis. So you could see that whole side of East Michigan Avenue as a true collaboration between the college and the community with the elementary school sitting at the heart of it all. The last element I just want to say before, before I take a couple of questions is that, you know, for this community to grow, uh, we need to have a place for people to start their children in school that is attractive and that is innovative. Um, we have the faculty and, and the uh, engaged members of our community here on the campus to help build a STEAM focused elementary school uh, and begin building a pipeline of, of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And perhaps down the road, we could talk about a middle school uh, and, and start to really build a, a robust pipeline together in this community. Um, you may know that uh, there is a Opportunity Zone fund downtown, the Big Albion plan. Uh, we're pretty close to announcing that that plan is fully funded. That will be a $19 million investment in Superior Street, uh, which will also bring new businesses and new young families, we hope, to the community. And it would be great if we could partner on an elementary school that they could feel good about. So that's, that's sort of my pitch. I think it could be really exciting to do this together. Um, and I hope that uh, that's something that you'll entertain in your conversation. That's really thank you, Dr. Um, Johnson. That go I was ahead. I'm going to just sorry. say thank you very much for for those ideas and the planning that you have on that. Looking forward to hearing more about that, and um, we'll discuss it with the committee and the board. Obviously, um, cool, good, good way to start the meeting. Richard, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I just uh, one of the things that is uh, that's time sensitive is when this fits in and when. I mean, I, I, I won't obviously speak for anybody, but I, I will support and, and uh, be a strong supporter of a new elementary school in, in Albion. Um, but Dr. Johnson, I think, is in a position where he needs to know, um, not, not that we're, we're in, but that if we are interested, that maybe we would have our people start talking to his architects so that if plans were made, they could go a certain way. Not that it would tie us into anything, because obviously we've got to take this to the voters and get it passed. And you know, we're going to be, we're a year out from actually turning any dirt anywhere, but if you put stuff in that you put it in the right, the right order, I guess. Yeah. Let me just speak to that briefly. So we are, in terms of our timeline, I'm taking a plan to the board uh, in late January. Um, and so uh, while, while Richard is right, we do not need to pin you down or make you commit to anything. If, if this was even uh, an interest of the board, then it would be great to have someone from the school district speak with our architects and explain what a 350 student elementary school, uh, perhaps STEAM focused would, would need to look like in terms of space. I, I can figure out how many square feet it is. It's not hard to multiply 158 square feet times 350 students, but I don't know how many offices, I don't know, you know what kind of space you need. So just to get that kind of sense to the architects so that they could have that as an option when I went to the board in, in the end of January um, to pitch the different versions of what this might look like would be very helpful uh, if it is indeed something you wanna entertain. If you don't, then that's fine, I understand, but uh, I would love to keep the door open 
if we can and and really figure out how to do this well. You know, from my perspective, there are economies to be had here, right? Uh, one heating and cooling system um, uh, and a variety of other things, right? Some shared walls, et cetera, uh, to see what we could do to economize. Uh, but the greater impetus for me is connecting in real ways, the college and the community. Um, Dr. Johnson, this is Shauna. Thank you for coming and talking to us. And I just wondered if you had um, a couple minutes left, if anyone on the committee might have any questions for you, if you'd be able to answer those. I do. I'll give you about 10 more minutes, but then Mayola knows I need to go and prepare for my own <laughs> board meeting. So. I can't see anything, so I don't know if anyone has um, any questions that they'd like to ask Dr. Johnson about. If you do, just please feel to unmute yourself and raise the question. I see someone in the chat uh, asked, where did 350 come from? That's a number that I took off of some documentation that I saw uh, that came from the school district. That's a school district number, as far as I understand. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I think that the 350 number was uh, a low projection of what could come out in Albion. Uh, <clears throat> I am one to believe that if you look at the growth in the district, that we could easily be talking about 350 to 400 students that could possibly be in the elementary because the real growth in our district will come from this portion of the district itself would be in Albion. Yes. Uh, so I, I, that's to in part to answer the question about the 350. I, I would agree in part that it might be low, especially because if you take the old premise, if you build it, they will come. And uh, I think folks would then come for something like that. I think the only one part outside of, the, uh, of that part would be when, when we look at a building and we look at uh, parking, playgrounds, the facility itself within the square footage that's allowed, uh, would there be enough room per se for 350, 400, uh, possibly 400 students to be able to, uh, uh, not only in the school building itself, but outside of the school building. Yeah, so, so th there, is, there is plenty of room, uh, particularly when you consider the other pieces of property we own over there behind Munger, for example, uh, where the clinic is. Um, you know, for uh, a 350 pupil elementary school, you need somewhere around uh, generous uh, would be around 50,000 square feet. Uh, 55,000 square feet would be extremely generous. Um, uh, uh, Washington Gardner itself is 174,000 square feet. And you can more than double that building on the piece of property that sits there. Without, without crossing any streets. Um, so if you cross the street and go over to Munger, you can, you can put a third building that big and probably a fourth building that big. So we have plenty plenty of building space um, and we can make a lot of green space too, so. I'm not, not sure if everybody's familiar with Marshall Middle School, which is where my parents went to high school years ago, uh, but we closed streets and the, the most recent building that was added actually was built across where a, a former street was at. So it's there's it's a similar footprint between the two schools. Um, there's, I think, probably a little bit more room in Marshall. Um, but that, if you look at a GIS map of that, you can kind of see what that footprint might look like. Yeah, I should also say that um, that we are also working with the county and the, um, the land trust to think about how we could play a role and, and the community foundation to think about how we might play a role in incentivizing uh, the development of affordable retirement housing around the cleared fields that are back there uh, yeah. where the industrial sites used to be. Um, we've, we've had some initial studies that show that we could probably support maybe as many as 60 uh, um, uh, individual uh, small house units in a village, so village style for retirement uh, housing. And it would be great to have that there next to the elementary school as well. The number one, uh, a tr number one uh, uh, amenity for retirement housing is having a college campus next door. The number two is having an elementary school next door. 
I'm just, I'm just, I, this is Dave Gobritz, by the way. Uh, Munger is, I'm just checking here, is west of Washington Gardner across the street from Berrien, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Th is that whole, that whole lot, or I should say from Berrien to Monroe, is that Albion College owned? There are two houses right on East Michigan. One that's yep. the, uh, that's the um, insurance agency. And I forget what the other one was. Those are private owned, but we go yep. behind them. So mm -hmm. we own the land down around and behind them. And there's a small building down at the end by the railroad tracks that we own. So it could connect uh, down there. Yeah. Yep. Dr. Johnson, since you're going to uh, present at your board meeting the end of January, you said, yes. what are you asking of Dr. Davis uh, for that presentation? So I, I'm asking that if the planning committee uh, thinks that this is at all a possible viable plan, that they let me know who, I, who on the committee I need to connect with our architects to lay out what a, what a program would look like for 400 elementary kids in a STEAM setting. And I'd be happy to include a, a couple of faculty from here who've done some thinking about STEAM education as well um, to think about what that building would need to look like. Then our architects can at least plan for how to build whatever we build in such a way that this could be attached to it or uh, that it might be easier to build it right along consecutive with it. Uh, what I'm asking the board for approval for in uh, January is, is a go ahead uh, pending our uh, securing of funding. And once I get that go ahead, then we'll have to know whether you're in with us or not after that point. But I can't even get to that point if we don't have some design work done first. Thank you. Dr. Johnson, we had uh, someone ask um, about building an elementary school on a brownfield. I don't know if you saw the comments, but- I did. The, the, where, where Washington Gardner is, is not a brownfield. It would not be built on a brownfield. The brownfield is down on the other side of the railroad tracks. It's the industrial site. Um, and that has been managed by the city and the land trust, and they regularly test uh, that. And they're testing right now where they took down um, the steel, the steel building, uh, Union Steel. And, uh, and so my understanding right now from the environmental folks in both the county and city is that that land has been remediated uh, and would be safe to what they call a cap. And so if you put a parking lot over it or you put a building over it that doesn't have a basement, that would be fine. But the school wouldn't be down there. That would be potentially developed for a parking lot or for uh, retirement housing, which, in which you wouldn't put a basement anyways because folks don't want to go up and down stairs. Dr. Johnson, uh, Dave again, just wondering what kind of augmentation would happen to Washington Gardner? Much, little, keep the shell, remove part of it? Our goal is to keep the front uh, and wings of the building intact. There are some additions in the middle and the back uh, that, that were put on uh, very late in the, in the building's history. Uh, boiler room and uh, some music rooms, they may need to come off or to be replaced. Uh, but the facade, the, what you see of the building today would largely stay intact. Uh, there may be some additional glass on the building to, to accommodate a, an accessibility entrance on the front. Uh, you, as you may know, as you go in that building, it's all stairs in every direction. Um, so we're gonna have to adapt that a bit, but our intent is to keep the building looking and feeling the way it is. Uh, we, are, we do have a tentative name of the building called the Body and Soul Center. Um, and we, we think that that kind of captures what we're trying to do in the building. Um, we've talked with some folks about doing an Albion African-American History Museum in the wells where the lockers come out and glass cases go in. We've talked about uh, putting the wildcat memorabilia back in the building. Um, and with the YMCA joining us, it's really exciting because that will allow us to maintain the community gym as a gym. Pool or no pool? <laughs> That's gonna be up to whether you guys come in the project and, and what we work out, but you know, with an elementary school, a YMCA, and the college, I, I got to believe we could figure something out. Pool's a big price tag. Yeah. Yeah. 
on the other hand, you don't need an auditorium if you partner with us because we have an auditorium. Right. So there are that that's what I mean by economies that can be had here if we work together. Yeah. Anything else from anyone? I would just say it's, I mean, cash is king. I mean, what's the, you know, what are we looking at in terms of numbers? I think as a committee, I don't see any harm in exploring it or, uh, you know, looking at the next steps. But I think if we're at a $12 million price tag, 16 million, and then maybe a 40, I think that would inform us a little bit. But um, from where we sit now, I don't see any issue with exploring it further. It sounds interesting. Um, John, I'm, I'm not an architect. Uh, I admit that right now, but I will tell you, we've done about five months of planning on the building right now and having seen what the costs are coming back for us on in the variety of different configurations and design pieces we're thinking about. Um, I, I gotta believe, um, and I know Doug Ledick is on here somewhere, my facilities director, I, I gotta believe that uh, for si what, what's, in the, what's in the documentation I've seen from the school district is 16 million. That 16 million is doable, very doable. Very good. Okay, well, thank you very much for taking your time, Dr. Johnson, coming in and joining us. Uh, we'll, we'll be back in touch. All right, take care, thank everybody. You. Bye bye. David, are you ready to move forward? Sure am, Dr. Davis. All right, I'm jumping into share screen mode here. Make sure everybody can see that. Are you seeing anything yet? It's flashing on my end, so. There we go. Got the got agenda. It now? Yeah, you got the agenda. Okay. Interesting conversation. So uh, we have another uh, guest with us tonight. Um, I'm, there he is, Jeremy. Uh, Mr. Root, uh, music department, I'm going to bring up uh, your document. And if you would, um, ladies and gentlemen, we've had several discussions with the principals, with the athletic department, uh, technology folks, et cetera. Um, Dr. Davis pointed out that uh, during all our shuffling with COVID and everything else going on, uh, we probably dropped a meeting with the music, the performing arts department, and uh, I uh, apologize for that situation. So we're trying to catch up on that tonight, and I will uh, pull up the list that was sent to you, um, which was generated by uh, uh, Jeremy and the performing arts staff for Marshall Public Schools. And sir, if you would like to take the podium, you're on. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I, I wanna start by saying I'm very appreciative to Dr. Davis and uh, to David for um, kind of working overtime a little bit the last few days as we got all of this finalized. Uh, all of you have the, the, the document that you can go over. My goal in the next five minutes is to just give you a very, very broad overview of what you're going to see in there. Um, and then of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Um, everything is broken down into two categories. One category would be um, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, and then the second category is instruments. This is necessary for two reasons. One, um, 
because of how expensive everything in the performing arts area is, um, uh, we, we don't have the budget to do big ticket item replacements. Um, the last, um, what I would consider really large investment uh, in instruments, for example, came um, 16, 17 years ago, and, and that was a $400,000 donation by uh, an alumnus of, of Marshall High School. Um, these things are just very expensive. And as a specific example, you know, one of the big shiny tubas that people see out on the football field when the marching band plays is about 10 grand. Um, and so this is, it's, it's just expensive stuff. Uh, because of how expensive it is, a lot of this equipment is old and we do the best we can. Um, uh, the central office makes sure that we have a good repair budget. So we're using instruments that are 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, and it's time for some of those to be replaced. That's one big reason. The other reason though, is that we are growing. And that's a good thing, but it can also create problems. Um, we need more of these instruments, especially in the areas of what I would consider to be smaller instruments. Uh, we don't want to turn any student away. Uh, especially for financial reasons. Many of you uh, on here, I've had, I've had your students and you know what it's like to rent an instrument. And the reality is that some folks in our district just can't do that. And, and we are bound and determined not to send those students away. We want them to be able to participate in band and choir and orchestra, um, but we have to have equipment to then loan them. And, um, and, and we are short on that. We started um, five or six years ago, beefing up our inventory of loaner equipment at the middle school. But now we're getting to a point where we also have to start beefing up that equipment inventory at the high school. So you'll see some of that in there as well. <clears throat> Again, very, very quickly, um, what you're going to see on that list at the high school is uh, replacement of band, choir, and orchestra um, concert and marching band uniforms. Um, that, is, that is a need. Um, and uh, also a replacement of the um, pianos that we use in our classrooms and in our practice rooms. Um, there was one in particular at the high school that I was looking at the other day when we have a piano tuner come out, they actually sign on the inside of the, uh, of the instrument a date um, and, and uh, one is at least 70 years old. Um, and uh, ba based on the markings that are on, on that. So you'll see uh, uniforms and then a, a piano replacement uh, across the middle school and high school. For choir, um, uh, replacing the choir risers at the middle school and high school, I won't go much farther than saying that's a significant safety issue at this point. Um, for orchestra and band, you're going to see replacement of large instruments that are so large that we don't, uh, and not just we, it's common, it is normal um, for districts to provide these. I, I referenced the $10,000 tuba. We don't expect a family to go out and do that. Um, so the, in, in any um, uh, certainly quality <clears throat> music program, those things are, are provided by the district. So you're going to see replacements and additions for, for large items uh, that families don't normally purchase on their own. And then you're going to see a number of instruments that um, we do ask families to rent if they are able to. Um, and some just aren't. And so we need to, as I said before, beef up those, uh, that inventory as well. Um, that is for both the high school and middle school for orchestra and band. You're also going to see language in there about some reshuffling of lockers at the middle school. This was back when the, from back when the middle school, uh, the, the new wing opened in, I think it was 2003. Um, and and we, we have lockers. Um, the orchestra program at the middle school, uh, which is experiencing significant growth, um, needs quite a few more lockers. Um, and then band, we have the correct number of lockers, but unfortunately they're in the wrong configuration as far as shape. We have way too many very tiny lockers and not nearly enough large lockers. And so because of that, we have big expensive instruments sitting on the floor because we have nowhere else to put them. Uh, also at the elementary school, you're going to see information about sound systems. Uh, these sound systems um, for uh, uh, 
Hughes and Gordon and, and Walters are over 15 years old. Components are not, uh, not working correctly. Um, and it, in terms of technology, um, uh, sound equipment and stuff, it's time for those to be updated. Uh, I do not believe that Harrington Elementary has a, a, um, a built-in sound system right now. Uh, and it's hard to teach music to the youngsters without a sound system. Uh, or without a sound system that's working. So um, uh, with this proposal, uh, every music student across the district is touched by this, um, including every student, every student in grades kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that folks might have. Okay. Seeing none, is there question. any other? Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there, maybe I missed it, is there um, a significance in the color of the highlight in terms of what that matters, the yellow versus the green? Yes. Yeah, if, if, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, I was just going to say in it, the yellow is the cost for replacement instruments. Um, and the green highlighted is, is what is called furniture fixtures and equipment. And I had another Hi, question. Jeremy. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Sheila. No, nope, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I am. Um, I don't. I don't know about the life of an instrument and that sort of thing. Can you explain um, the? You know, at what point do you decide that you need to replace an instrument instead of um, just repairing it? Can you explain that? I'm sorry. I started talking while I was muted. Um, we we always try to uh, repair equipment. We, we, um, we've used uh, many businesses in the area. We used to have a contract with Masteller Music in Battle Creek. Right now we work primarily with Meyer Music um, that has a couple stores in Michigan, but the one we use is the one in, in uh, Portage. Um, and uh, it, as long as uh, an instrument's not totaled, we, we, we try to repair it. Um, and sometimes uh, those repairs come back $250, $300, um, and uh, we, we'll, we still, you know, that's still cheaper than buying a new instrument. And so once we get to a point, though, that um, an instrument, for example, maybe has to go in multiple times a year because it's just falling apart or an instrument is so old that the repair companies can't get the parts anymore. It's not too different than a car. Um, then we have to start looking at possibly replacing and a number of these uh, instruments that would be on our list to replace are instruments that we really would have rather replaced quite a while ago. Um, uh, it's a very much smaller scale um, but similar to the discussion of the elementary building, uh, the, the Harrington Elementary building, where it's going to cost X amount of dollars to fix it up how we want to, but it's, it's, it's this much to get a new one that's going to last so much longer. And then you just have to kind of make the calculation about which is the, is the more prudent route. unmute myself. Any other questions? <laughs> um, so, just a question. So Jeremy, you were, you heard the presentation by Dr. Johnson. I mean, what, what, what would the potential, Im I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but and what's the potential impact of having, you know, having college students available to help, you know, in addition to our, our paid staff, is that, I'm, I'm thinking that's that's a positive, but any thoughts on that? It's fantastic. First of all, I was doing cartwheels when he used the word steam instead of STEM. Steam, in case if you if you didn't catch it, uh, is is the STEM concept with the addition of the arts. So I was thrilled that that that's the direction that they want to go uh, with. Um, I'll just give you in my area a real quick example of how something like that could be fantastic for us. Um, there are a lot of music majors at Albion College who need hands-on practical experience with students, and we have a lot of 
countless students at Marshall Middle School, Marshall High School, maybe even in the earlier ages, um, who would love to have, for example, a private tutor on their instrument or could engage in early childhood music classes or things like that. Um, the reality of music classes is that they are big. Um, last year, the, the high school marching band was 150 people with two teachers. And, and we're fortunate to have two teachers, but that's still one, one teacher for 75 kids. And, and, it's, and, it, and there are some limitations there. So I, I think that there's a ton that could be done um, uh, positive for both the, the Albion College students and the students of the Marshall Public Schools. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing none, thank you, Jeremy. Um, started to say earlier, but uh, uh, ran into um, Zoom congestion, I guess. Um, my internet became unstable. So I wanted to just thank you. Uh, Jeremy's worked really hard to put uh, some very good information for us together very quickly, and I appreciate his patience in uh, uh, helping us get that put together. So thank you again. All right. Agenda items four and five uh, on your agenda are there uh, as reminders. I don't know that we need to go through that information again unless anybody has any questions. Amanda's shaking her head no. David's saying no. John says no. Okay, good. That's what I was thinking too. So in uh, prioritization work, we're ready to start on that. <clears throat> And I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone, uh, we did get, uh, I worked with Brad uh, this week and, and uh, CSM, and we've got uh, the, uh, all the Marshall buildings. This is all the remaining items um, from the 2010 uh, projects that weren't addressed. Um, and we have now put that in the same format as all of the Marsh or the Albion buildings. Uh, so you can see it's prioritized by uh, the need. It's also categorized in case we want to look at that. Uh, I, I appreciated Joanna's comment to you all. Maybe you didn't see that, but uh, she mentioned that the bucket um, column on our spreadsheets doesn't necessarily align with the um, the guiding principles and that is true um, it's also just another way to help groups like yourselves categorize and prioritize information so uh, i appreciated that uh, rob had uh, put those on the spreadsheets you know some districts energy is a big priority uh, here i think learning environments uh, are being discussed as probably the highest priority that I'm hearing so far. Um, and again, priority one, two, three, four lines up with those that you see on the agenda. Now, what I found interesting as we went through and as I suspected previously is look at this column, priority number one, which we said happens immediately. As we go down through, there's very little that ended up for facilities in priority one. A few things at the high school regarding some walkways uh, in looking at this uh, C1 through C5 item. Most of those were related to the athletic fields and would likely be covered if we did some athletic improvements uh, as part of the uh, scope of work. So. Very, David, David yes. I'm just going to jump in, pardon me. Um, I remember at our last meeting, these were what Brad went through from a maintenance, building maintenance uh, standpoint, and he wasn't necessarily using that rubric 
um, to evaluate those. So I, I put in the chat, are we, are, is this something that you want us to do as a group, each line item going through and evaluating one to four? Um, I mean, I, I will tell you, I did this on my own of each of these things, but I don't necessarily know all of the things. And, but I also want to be cautious that we're not necessarily lobbying for, you know, I really want this item and, and I don't want us to get hung up on yes uh, that piece, you know, so I don't know if there's some guidelines or parameters or, if you want us to go down that road. Well, the, in our some of our previous meetings, Mr. Turner, um, it was the direction of the committee to put this uh, prioritization of this assessment generated uh, information in the hands of facilities because they're the ones dealing with it day to day. Um, so they, uh, the instructions were, we're not experts on uh, this kind of stuff. We would prefer to um, receive input from Brad and his folks, which is what we've done so far. Uh, I don't know that you need to go through and do it line by line. You're welcome to do that if, if there are specific uh, things you want to look at. What we were asking from the meeting last week was just, does this look appropriate? Uh, on a big scale, does it look like what you expected? So um, I think this is really good information and I appreciate all of all of the work. I'm sure all of this is very tedious going through line items and expensing out things. Um, so thank you for that. And thanks to Brad and, and his team for doing that. But I wonder if we should talk about some of the, like the big picture theory, you know, are we going to build a new elementary school? Is that where we're heading? Like, like, I feel like that needs to be decided because that's a huge bulk of what we're talking about. And so I think coming to a consensus on at least that as, as a priority or not, so that we can um, move on to the next prioritization. Yes, so that, that's perfect, uh, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's exactly lining up with what I had on the prioritization work. Um, I wanted to show you that we are continuing to update and I sent you this. So, okay, so last time you saw this document, Gordon had some numbers up here. Those have now been moved out and these are titled essentials, um, which were the priority one items. Um, but to getting on to those other big topics uh, are uh, the intent of the meeting tonight too. And we can look at additions to facility. We can look at uh, one of the things I wanted to know was if we look at this sheet, we're still carrying 4.4, almost $4.5 million for coal, um, $4.8 million. Should that fall from the list? Dave? And it, yes. That, David, to that point, the committee has talked about along the way since really the beginning um, that Kroll and Harrington have very short life left in those buildings. That yes. We don't have an interest in putting a full investment into those buildings. Kroll can be managed, I think, whatever we do with that building, if it becomes a marketing issue of trying to market that building and have somebody uh, pick it up, or we close it and mothball it and decide what we're going to do at that point. There's very little, there's probably a lot that we could do to that building, the four point some million you're talking about. There's not a lot we would want to do with that building at this point, except for getting us through the current use until it, until it shifts our it shifts out of our hands. Yes. Um, so I think that's more of a maintenance discussion than it is a, a bond discussion. Right. So okay. if the committee is in agreement, I would like to take Kroll off, off the list of consideration here. Okay, by show of 
thumbs or down. Hold them up there for a minute so we can just make the scan here. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh, you're such a good group. Thank you for cooperating on that. Um, I, I, I just want to mention that we have had, I don't want to say pushback because that's not the right right word, but concern in the community about that school. And again, when a community lo uses, loses these buildings that are beyond their serviceable life, um, there needs to be a process. And I guess it's almost like grieving to lose the, you know, the, the process of stages of grief. So when we get ready to do whatever we're going to do, there needs to be some public involvement. There needs to be some conversation. I mean, I think at this point, I, I fold my thumb was up. Don't invest any more money into the building, but I just, it, it, it ought not to be us necessarily making that decision. It's got to be some community involvement to do that. But I think as Randy has heard you say it, we're just talking about seeing it through at this point is a maintenance issue to its end of kind of end of its life type thing. Right. And, and, and possibly find alternative use for it, Richard, et cetera, based on, on feedback from the community. Perfect. Thank you. Um, then the other thing would be Harrington. Um, we know that as it, to Amanda's point and to the committee's point that we've all talked about wanting to have a new elementary school in Albion. Um, we know it's going to take two years to get us from point A to point B um, if everything's working great. So it means that we have to invest enough into Harrington to maintain its level of quality to be able to continue to educate kids there until it's time to move. Is Robert, is that what you're thinking? Okay. <clears throat> I know uh, if we were to go over the next couple of years, yes, sir, you are correct. There would be some things that automatically that we would need to do to this building so that we could provide the type of service we need to children. Uh, some of the things would definitely be off the table in terms of, of, of enlarging the building and doing anything that would make sense. But definitely, if we were looking at a new building, there are some items and some things that we need to address so that we could function properly over the next couple of years. You are Right, so with that, I do believe that falls in the same realm as maintenance and um, commitment with sinking fund or dollars that could be managed by our, our facilities department and our administration. Um, Becky's probably chewing uh, her gum right now about that, but um, we do have to find with what you've already done with the needs assessment, David and, and uh, Robert, we do need to go through that with Brad and say, okay, here are the absolutes that need to take place. And here's the timeline in which that occurs because we have to get at least two more good years out of this life cycle of this building. Um, at that point, and to, to Richard's question, because Richard, you're gonna have the same question when it comes down to um, Harrington, um, is how do we move forward with that building? Um, what is that commitment going to be? Can it be, um, alternative use, et cetera, but the idea is to get it off our, our threshold and we have to figure that out. So that's still an issue that'll be in front of us as a, as a bond committee. Do you, do, you all, do you all understand that and agree with where I'm going with that? Can we do another thumb up or thumb down, David? Yeah, thumbs up everybody. So what, what I heard Dr. Davis was that the um, there's commitment from the district to explore alternative uses for these buildings, but you're proposing for them to fall from the scope of the planning committee's jurisdiction at this time. Yes. Not saying that we're done with it, not saying that we're publicizing that we're stepping away from it because we're not, we're still gonna maintain and, and manage it. The question will be, can we come to a resolution for our district regarding those two facilities? So this is this is Shauna, and I just wanted to say something really quickly about that. So it, it seems like 
um, and based on the questions in the chat too, it seems like there um, is a need to find out like, you know, what is the cost of um, being able to maintain the building in the meantime? Yeah. Um, and I mean, so first of all, does anyone have any idea how much that is like roughly? Mm -hmm. you know, we Good question. David? Yeah. And uh, Shauna, that's something that with the core group uh, in our initial planning, we did look at that. And I know that CSM has put some information together regarding costs to maintain. Um, Brad, are you still on or did you have to drop off? I don't see Brad. I'm, I'm here yeah, for I a bit more. Okay. And I kind of remember, I kind of remember that being done. I just wondered if anyone knew that number off the top of their head, you know, because obviously that's a question that people were asking when they're trying to make those decisions. Um, yeah, and then it, the other thing, the other thing I think is um, important for us to remember is um, while we, we don't want to, if, if we do decide to do a new building and we don't want to like, quote unquote, waste money, but we also want to make sure that Harrington is at least um, as supportive um, as the other elementary buildings in the district. Um, and at this point, you know, we know that that has been a struggle. And so we have to be careful when we're saying you know, do enough to keep the doors open and things like that, because at this point, that's all we've been doing. Um, and there's reasons around that. But at the same time, you know, our kids can't go another two years um, with the bare minimum and expect to be excelling. Like that part has to be included in that conversation. So whenever those numbers are put together, just, you know, make sure that that is a part of that conversation. And Ms. Gamble and group, I might be wrong and David could probably actually expand on it more, but I know if we look at the numbers that they talked about when they talked about uh, a full project of trying to revitalize Harrington, uh, I'm not sure if just taking out the additions and some of those things would uh, give folks a clearer picture, uh, but it, that is a question that you have that pertains is like, what is enough to go by and, and get through? And what is too much within a building that you know you want to close? So uh, I don't know. And David could, you know, respond to that more than I could in terms of numbers. But I, I think that that's, that's going to be the trickiest piece of how much is the committee in the district willing to put into Her Harrington at this point? Uh, looking at it, if, if there is going to be a new school, and that is something that uh, I think Ms. Lyons alluded to, it was that that's just one thing that hasn't been quietly determined. Like, okay, we're, Harrington is going, I mean, Albion, this community is going to get a new school. Now, now from there, the other part is off the table, but within that, what is it gonna cost to keep it going and making sure that it's adequate? Because anything that you put in here, we're not going, this building is not, going to be on the same terms of other buildings in the district within doing it anything we do. We just have to make sure what is put into this building is going to be good enough so that we can provide the instruction that these babies need and, and some of the other things that go along with it. So, mm -hmm. Question for Shauna um, to help work on the answer to your question. I'm, I'm wondering what what does the uh, what does the answer to that question tell you? What what are you looking to um, confirm? Um, the cost to maintain the building, and then also that the um, what the children have have been lacking so far is taken into consideration. Because, like I said, they can't go another two years. So I think I think Mr. Giles said it very well like like um what are we going to consider to be the minimum to keep the doors open what does that actually look like and how do we keep from um having our kids suffer because we're trying to get a different a new building for them mm. so okay. so but that's not a that's not something that i can necessarily answer i think that that's you know administrators and and teachers that know what it is that the kids need, even like Mr. Root being able to say the things that are needed in that building 
and to come up with creative ideas um, to get those things even temporarily without wasting money. Like, you know, and, and yeah, so that's, so that was my question basically was so that people have a number and then two, so that that's on people's minds when they're considering what the minimum is. So that, that was all. I, I okay, good. Um, let us work on that information and we'll yeah. try and update you. David. Uh, at, yeah, Todd. Brad had his hand up. He wants to, to answer the question. And we do, we did put some preliminary numbers together on that, but not making excuses. A lot of that can be guesswork depending upon major system failures, right? So Brad, go right. ahead. That's what I was going to say as well, Todd, is that it's really difficult to say, here's a hard and fast number that you can plan on. Um, it's probably, uh, you know, if, if the boilers go down, we have to do something with the boilers and, and get them back running. So, Brad, I'll go ahead and let you speak. Yeah, that was one thing I wanted to comment on is that first, there are two points. One is that we are just, I mean, tomorrow morning, it could be a whole different show than we have <laughs> there. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, boiler replacements. Um, I know different sizes of different buildings. I mean, we could drop 30, 40 grand like in five minutes on, on doing boiler issues if those come up. Um, having said that, I don't want, um, and again, I don't, I'm not taking it as insult. Don't, don't get me wrong there. I don't, I don't think about providing for the kids as, as uh, like band-aiding something to get to the next month or the next year. Um, I mean, there's things we're doing like the new playground equipment is being shipped this week and that can be moved to a new building, whether wherever that goes or whatever. Um, and that we do repairs, um, they're not, when I'm doing the repairs, I'm not thinking that it's okay, if this gets me 14 months, then I'm good. I'm thinking we're gonna repair it and repair it a certain way and that Robert can count on it with his kids for going forward. And I think that's just about, I mean, there's a lot of messaging with that, but um, just, just so again, I didn't take it from you that way, Shauna, but put it out there. We're not looking at putting band-aids on leaking pipes to get to six months from now or anything. Yeah, I understand that. And that's actually a good segue into the next building I wanted to talk about, which would be the Opportunity High School. Um, every day is a, is a journey with that building. Um, Brad and his crew are doing a really great job of keeping that functional. Um, there, there are, I looked at the list and just in priority one for maintenance, we're looking at about almost $9 million in infrastructure issues relative to heating, cooling, plumbing, et cetera, that is a priority one in Opportunity High School. Um, we can't do that adequately in a sinking fund and we can't do that adequately in, in operations budget. So that's gonna have to be a lift to some degree in the, in the bond probably sooner than later, because I'm really concerned about, and I know Brad is, about keeping that facility to the level it needs to be in regards to what we're, what we're using it for. That being said, we just talked about a, a, an idea from Dr. Johnson that if we don't build a new elementary school on the Albion Watson Street campus, then what is that campus going to be used for? So we have an opportunity high school and quite frankly, we could, we could get creative on those things as well. Um, it's a huge campus, it's a huge facility. And if we don't multi-purpose in that building, we have to ask ourselves, what's the efficacy of that building? Um, so this is this opportunity that's being brought to us from Albion College raises the question that we have to wrestle with as a board and as a committee. 
Well, um, the oh, sorry, dog barking. While the the gentleman from Albion College was speaking and discussing all of the amazing po possible opportunities there, it occurred to me to think why not include us as the opportunity school in with that as well. That if our building is so, um, you know, <laughs> used up, so to speak, Challenge. and so large for our purpose, and they're going to put a Y in there and they're going to put all that other stuff, you know, why couldn't the Opportunity School be moved into a more appropriate building in that same facility? It's very interesting. Very and then, of course, we have the upgraded um, Eastern Academic Center for KCC with all the uh, uh, manufacturing um, uh, equipment there for manufacturing certifications. So, yeah, there's a lot to think about through that. And that's programming, envisioning that the district needs to go through regarding this. Um, as long as we're in that building, we do have some pretty significant upgrades to infrastructure that needs to occur. Um, this is Shauna again. So I have just a quick <laughs> clarification. Um, so am I hearing correctly that when we, when the committee was discussing um, a new building that it was only discussing connecting this building to the Opportunity School? No. Okay, the, I just wanted to clarify that. No, the conversation is just simply a new elementary. The, the concepts were similar to what we were doing, um, Shauna, with what we did with uh, Walters, not the same exact building, but what we did with Walters in its proximity to the high school um, keeping it on a central campus was a was a consideration because when you do that, you get some economies of scale through that process. Um, infrastructure, land already present, parking lot structure already there, um, you know, football field, et cetera. Um, it's just if we don't do it there, then we have some pretty significant questions to have about how do we maintain a campus with a swimming pool and, and so on and so forth there that is on really shaky ground in regards to um, being able to maintain without significant maintenance upgrade. Um, so, I mean, it's just a question now. It becomes an additional question in the process if we don't locate an elementary school there. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Sure. Okay. So I wanted to address that, David, just to kind of put that on the table and then and then um, it might help us move forward a little bit quicker on some other priorities. So, so Randy, I, I just have to say something that's that's bugged me for a while. We're talking about building a, a practice gym in Marshall and, and conceptually I'm not opposed to it, but there's a beautiful gym at Albion and I, and I guess I'm, you know, I'm curious, and there's the pool is, is is there as well. I mean, is it? Do we need to have a conversation where we think about what we need to do with that building and what the future looks like? I mean, it is, it is on on the highway. Um, you talk about what the, the, the training thing is really intriguing to me, and obviously have been you know very supportive of the, of the KCC um, relationship. I just. I feel like we need more development of what that could look like. And I don't want to put any more money into something that doesn't make any sense, but it also, it's a good location yeah. and it's um, it has, it has some positives uh, clear, as well. Clearly Richard, I'm not advocating to leave it. I'm just telling you that, that the, the, the challenges of that building are big and we have to, we have to look at that and then re-envision what, what we need to use that building for. I mean, Opportunity High School is, yeah. is doing well in that, in that environment. If that building continues to be maintained and, and upgrades that are necessary, that's a pretty big cost, but it's doable. Um, I'm not suggesting that we close yeah. up a pool in the gym. I'm just telling you that we have to make some good decisions about visioning and what's going to go on in the future with that. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm just emphasizing what you said and saying the same thing, Randy. Yeah. I, I agree. Dr. Davis. 
the yeah. the one thing that I want to add is that when, when when the committee looks at uh, what Dr. Johnson presented and look at the location that we're talking about on Watson, uh, the the, the location, in my opinion, this is my opinion only, the location on Watson allows a uh, a huge advantage for elementary children in terms of amenities that that property already has. Uh, one of the things that we have suffered with over the last four years, one of the things when we look at uh, for opportunities is like swimming. Uh, we're not in a position to be able to uh, go outside the area without taking too much from the academic day. Uh, that that The building right next door, if that was the case, would have that availability and it would eliminate Dave's question that he had earlier about a pool and then the cost of a pool, as well as the fields and everything else. I think that that property over there opens up a lot of opportunities community-wise and as well for an elementary, if it was built there, I just wanted to put that out there, that there, there are some connections with a school being adjacent to it, similar to what you have in Marshall with Walters and the high school that the children from that new elementary could take advantage of. And it would be their, our advantage as well as the communities. Yeah. How about, can we hear from other members of the Albion community that's on the committee in regards to location? I know that, I know that, during the annexation, there was a lot of push to make sure that we maintain Kroll, that we maintained an elementary or a presence in the north side of Albion. Um, any, any comments about that on what this might look like as we wrestle with the idea of location of an elementary? Mark Lally here. One of the things uh, Marshall Public Schools has no shortage of in Albania is land. <clears throat> so, um, you know, a location, the offer from, from uh, Matthew Johnson, you know, it, uh, of land in and of itself doesn't really add much. Uh, you, you'd have to look at, is there a compelling educational reason, uh, a compelling financial reason to locate it there? I'm concerned that it's a pretty constrained location. There's not much opportunity to expand at any point if you wanna do that. Um, whereas the old, uh, the Opportunity School has tons of land for that. And, and um, so it's just something to consider. I mean, ultimately it's the school board's gotta make that decision that um, all the things that, that uh, Matthew Johnson talked about could happen at any school in Albion. It's, uh, you know, it's the location isn't totally dependent on, you know, being very close to Albion College. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else? The, the partnerships that the college currently has with the public school district, um, I imagine would continue, just like Mark said, regardless of where the location is, as long as it's in Albion, it just makes it much more convenient. Um, I think over time we've seen the loss of our real neighborhood schools um, all over the place, certainly in Albion where we only have one. But I think that maintaining a school in Albion is really critical and I think we can all acknowledge that. I like the idea of putting the, um, uh, like of combining the Kroll school uh, population with the Harrington elementary school population um, at the, at the Opportunity High School sort of area. And I think Mark makes a really good point and it's been mentioned before that the that there is plenty of land for that. Um, you know, and I actually, when I think about uh, what uh, Mr. Giles said about um, like swimming. So you don't need to take a bus then to get the kids to the swimming pool when they have activities that involve that. So having um, sort of that central location um, actually might be even very helpful uh, for the day-to-day -day running of the school district's, you know, buildings uh, within Albion too. Um, one of the things that I get concerned with when I think about the Opportunity High School and even in other school buildings is also the cost of maintenance um, as well. So over the long run, like what is that per year cost? And so um, maybe some of those sort of thoughts need to be discussed too, like how much does it cost to keep those build, you know, the building running? And just to clarify, we're only 
we we are we have one of two pools in Albion. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. College has college. one. I think so. Oh, cool. The high school. Those are the only two. Yeah. Okay. You know, Dr. Johnson really did give us some some uh, reason to think um, about what's going on. But I tell you, just after talking to um, Albion citizens, it would be really difficult, I think, to not have a single school building in Albion uh, that is just that's Albion's. Uh, you know, and I don't know if we go with the college, are we, what kind of school are we? Uh, are we run by the college or are we a Marshall school? I'm not sure about that, but I just think that the citizens of Albion would love to continue to have and would just adore having a brand new school to call Albion School for the Albion district. And that at the Opportunity School would give them that. Thanks, Eddie. I, you know, I, I, I go that. back to part of this whole issue is unifying in a real way one district, right? And making sure that we are the public school system for Albion, the Albion area, and uh, Albion is a part of us and we're a part of them. And we have to keep in mind that as we go forward in these discussions as well. Dr. Davis, um, this is Doug Lenitka. I'm the AVP for facilities at, at Albion College, and I've been part of this group uh, because of COVID. I haven't nearly the involvement I wanted to, for obvious reasons, trying to right. keep our, our campus up and running. Just Glad a, to have you back, Doug. <laughs> just a couple quick comments. Um, our students talk about how far away downtown is, and, and we struggle to try to get them to walk three blocks there. And so I know that the Opportunity Zone, um, I, I think we'll have less foot traffic and less involvement from students if we have to figure out a way to transport them. Logistically, it creates some headaches versus them, you know, going from a class in Washington Gardner to across the street to, to an elementary school or something like that. So I, I wanted to just mention that. Um, and then, so one other thing I wanted to mention is um, we are working uh, with, with Todd McDonald, who's on here, and CMS on some of the estimating for the projects we're doing. So we can absolutely do some of our own, you know, some, some of our own estimating. We can be carrying multiple different uh, types of projects as we're having our discussions. So I know Dr. Johnson talked about, uh, we have some big decisions to make with the board in the next month or so um, in terms of long, long term for Washington Gardner, but that doesn't mean that we have to walk out of there with an exact model of who our partners are or what the exact project is gonna be. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, that we have some partners that are on on this committee that are also working on some of the things on campus that can be beneficial as, as this group is thinking about what those opportunities are and and whether it's a connection or it's across the street. You know, we I, I learned about this yesterday for the first time. So we, we haven't had any discussions or anything um, uh, internally more than uh, a short one with Dr. J earlier today. OK, thank you. Well, just one final comment is all this, of course, is dependent on a bond passing. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have to think about what increases the likelihood that voters will, will go for it, too. That's just one other consideration. Yeah. I was. Uh... You're muted. Okay, Perfect. I, here I thought I had unmuted myself, sorry. Uh, I was thinking about that same idea, Mark, in terms of what would be the most compelling for the uh, community to get behind and support. Um, but I, and I also wanna say from being principal at Harrington for a number of years, the, um, the impact that the college, the location of the college had, you know, was really positive in terms of um, mentors. I mean, we had over a hundred college students that could walk in and out of the building and, and they would do that pretty easily. I'm, I'm not sure that getting to that other campus would be as easy for things like that. You know, the proximity to, you know, being able to use science labs and go to art exhibits. And I mean, just all of the things that the college has to offer. It, it's something that I think we want to think about pretty, clearly and seriously. 
but I mean, I'm really, torn. I have to, I really have to think about this a lot because the idea of having all of that space out near the opportunity school um, is a real bonus also. So a lot to think about and um, I will, I will continue to wrestle with it. <laughs> Well said, uh, Dr. Davis. Would are there other items or questions? No. Or would I'm you sorry Would you have me continue? That, <clears throat> sorry to take you down that path, but I thought it was no, no, no. That that's of these things. It's Go a good ahead. discussion. Go um, what What I would like to remind the committee at this point is we're our major. Uh, impetus right now is to uncover or uh, prioritize what amount of money um, should be uh, asked of the voters, right? That's, that's what we're all in this about, uh, is understanding if we do a bond, number one, and number two, what size is that bond? And then we would understand what's in it and what the cost impact uh, to that is. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we would have to decide on that location in order to prioritize. And I think that's where Dr. Davis started a while ago was to do another thumbs up or thumbs down on the new building. So those of you that uh, cameras off, cameras on if you can and give us I mean, what I would like to know from you is item 6H, remodel and additions to Harrington versus the new facility. And really what we're talking about is a dollar amount. We're not talking about where that new building would go. We're talking um, the, I think it was somewhere around 12 to 13 million for remodeling and additions to uh, Harrington versus the 16 million for a new facility wherever it would go. Um, so the question is, who's on board uh, with the new facility? Who would support that? Okay, I don't see anybody that's a, that's a no. And we've already asked that question. Thank you, Jane, we see you. Um, so that, that will um, help us again on our worksheet to start to cross some things off, right? So Harrington, remodel. Yes, it does not address the what do we need to put in it on an annual basis to keep it. Um, but that will work on getting that information uh, gathered for you. Sorry. The, there was another 5 million. In additions. There was another 400,000 roughly in furniture. So good, we're starting to whittle down and you can see the number down at the bottom is 75. As of today, we were a little less than that, uh, 85 uh, last week. Um, but the prioritization work that we did on the uh, Marshall uh, things has helped that. Um, and eventually what I'd like to do is get the things moved over to priority one, priority two, priority three, priority four, as we prioritize and um, see how those stack up uh, in terms of the total cost. All right, so new, I think we got this one covered. I know we have this one covered. Any comments from the Albion 
facility assessment worksheets, anything that has risen to the top in your review of those things that we need to discuss? Can, can we discuss a little bit about um, the moving of uh, the early childhood into the opportunity school or that proposal? Dr. Davis, you want to do you want to cover that, or would you like me to? I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, so, Larry, all of those programs we have operating right now at, at Scroll are subcontracting. I mean, ones with a lot of it's with the ISD, a lot of it's with um, Community Action, uh, then Community Unlimited was a discussion at one point. Now the YMCA is running their GSRP out of that program. And it sounds like as soon as available, they would be able to run that outside of Kroll. So um, they are doing, they're provide, uh, Community Unlimited is providing services for us for some of our programming um, at uh, Shamrock, but not at Kroll. Um, basically the, um, I'm sorry, early childhood, um, great start early childhood, that program, those slots are being run now by the um, Battle Creek Y. They were awarded by the ISD to the Y. That's the ISD's decision, but we wanted to make sure we were good partners with them on that. So really we have nothing to move unless um, everybody says, you know, you, 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 get out, you get out of the business of Kroll, we don't want to be here either. I don't know how that's going to transpire. We just have to kind of work through those decisions. Does that make sense, Larry? Did that answer your question? Good. <laughs> All right. Going back to our agenda. The spreadsheet you've seen additions to facilities i want to talk a little bit about that that's a little trickier one let's talk about uh technology and where we might prioritize that and there's no assumptions right now in terms of um, bond total or series or anything like that all we know at this point is Richard has identified approximately $2.7 million. <clears throat> and according to our uh, guiding principles, where would the group prioritize that? He explained to you what would be involved in that. He explained to you uh, the benefits to students. Uh, he's put a price tag on it for you and kind of walk you through what there is in the district today. I'm going to ask you to do, instead of a thumbs up, we're going to do uh, just a kind of a quick straw poll. And it's, a, it's either a one, a two, a three, or a four. Okay. So ready? Okay. Cameras are coming on. Hold them up there. Can you repeat okay. the question again for that and what one, two, et cetera mean? And, yes, and Dave, Dave, before you jump in, because there's someone put in here, don't feel qualified to make this judgment. I think that's a real thing. Why don't you make a fist if you don't, if you're unsure? At least that way you as opposed to some other gestures that would be probably a different number one right there. Yes. <laughs> As a pro. So if you're feeling uncomfortable in prioritizing that, um, we've tried to make you as uh, uh, knowledgeable as uh, I was going to say as Richard, but I don't know that I could even achieve that um, goal. He's, done a great job stepping up into that position right away. Um, all right, one more time. So we're going to we're going to add a fifth ranking. It's either one, two, three, four or a fist, I guess, is what Dave wants to do. If you don't if you don't have an opinion on it. Ready? What's what's yeah. the question? 
Again, what do we have an opinion on? Yeah. What? All right. So, um, Vivian, ask your question again. There, I want to make sure I have that. What? The, yeah, so, I was just asking you to uh, kind of re-explain what we're voting on exactly. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. So on the agenda, every time I've been placing for you the guiding principles, these are what we're evaluating these things based on. Those are your comments. Here is the scale for your ranking, priority one two, three, four, as identified for you here. And what we're actually talking about is item 6E right now, looking at the worksheet is identified for you as approximately $2.7 million. And I would believe that uh, Richard's on the call. He's identified 2.7 being kind of the, the minimum. He's identified much more, very very similarly to what we've done with the assessments and, and all of that. $2.7 million, is that a priority one, a priority two, a priority three, a priority four? To include in a potential bond scenario. What do you think, Mark? <laughs> okay, Mark's the fist. I don't know, he says. Okay. Uh, I see Dr. Davis with a two. Uh, I see uh, some others. Oh, thank you, Vivian, Jeremy, Edie, Tara, Richard, thank you. Okay, good, good. Dr. Davis, you said two. Do, do you want to talk about that? You know, I'm, I'm wrestling with two or one. And here's here's the thing. I just look at the priority one and it says uh, to accomplish as soon as possible. I agree that we need to have a plan and it's got to be implemented. Um, I think it meets a lot of the criteria under our um, essential guiding principles. Um, so I know it's really incredibly important. I just think the timing of it could be stretched out over a period of time and not immediate for the whole what is it? Um, Two million dollars. Two point seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm wrestling with it. Okay. Very good. One number one priority for folks. Okay. Yeah. And All if right. I could really quick, the uh, really I think we're going to be about uh, somewhere closer to one million as far as a uh, immediate. Uh, part if you're talking about like a bailout catch up like all of those types of things the other portion of that was things that would be stretched out over the uh, bond years in my opinion okay right so and so that everybody knows um when a school district uh or municipality does a bond issue very similar to this um uh, the Department of Treasury State of Michigan requires expenditure of those dollars within five years. Um, that's five years from sale of the bonds, not the election date, but five years to expend. So 2.7 could actually be broken down into what's the cost uh, per year. And what I heard Richard say uh, in response to Randy's comment was that maybe a million the right up front and 1.7 then spread over the next four years in kind of a refresh rate. And that, that's really important from a technology standpoint that we don't buy $2.7 million worth of technology on a, in one fell swoop because everybody knows what happens to technology, right? As soon as you yeah. take it out of the box, <laughs> it's obsolete and it needs to be replaced. Um, so when you spread that out over the five years, that gets you into this kind of refresh cycle uh, coming through. Um, and and I, I, we've already had that kind of discussion regarding furniture as well, which is another uh, topic that I was uh, um, 
going to ask you about. How about how about we talk about performing arts? Um, you saw two numbers from Jeremy, and you got a a presentation from him tonight. What would where would you put uh, those two numbers? Let's do F, F, and E first, which was uniforms and, and uh, things like that. Risers, uniforms. Is that a one, a two, a three, or a four? So okay. I don't have the answer, but I, this... Um... So number one, let me clarify this. I've never been a part of a, a bond uh, group like this before, but some of these things just feel really arbitrary. <laughs> and it's really, all of it is important. All of it is absolutely important, but it, it, it just feels really hard to make these decisions. Right. When, uh, um, <laughs> When I'm not quite sure how to say this, but I feel like we need to have a, a larger discussion about vision and what our community wants for our kids and what our parents want for our kids and where what all of this is adding up to. And so it just makes it really hard, like the discussion about Harrington. What do we want for our kids? What do we want for our elementary kids? that go to Harrington? Do we wanna have a focus on STEAM? Do we want to locate them in this area? You know, what is missing right now in their education? So, so for me personally, it seems like this is a really, a really difficult thing to do. This, this is the so hardest I'm part of, yes. You, you guys have the hardest part, the hardest job in this whole thing, doing an assessment, all of that legwork and crunching these numbers and putting together design scenarios. But, you know, what, what I hear you saying, you know, if it's too hard to prioritize, I also heard you say when we presented a $54 million bond scenario, that was too much. And we're showing 75 million tonight. So how do those hard decisions get made, Amanda? If, if, I, think if, we I, can, let's say if I can jump in, just going through this process, it doesn't mean that we're married to any decision that we make. We've got to narrow this down. And then once we start narrowing it down, we will come back and revisit some of the things that we prioritized. It'll come down to how much money we think we can get from our community. Um, there's also the politics of, of where is the money going to be spent? How is it going to be spent? And, and having some conversation with parents outside of this. But until we actually go down, we are making very difficult decisions right now. And it's, and it's challenging to, to say, well, I think this is more of a value than something else. There's a lot of what ifs and, and anything and everything that we do. Who thought that we'd be dealing with COVID right now? and the importance or how that has impacted um, not just us as a school, but impacted our bond vision and where we need to go. Because for example, technology is huge and access to, techno to technology is very important. Had we not had this COVID situation, technology maybe would have been a two, possibly. Um, so you make the best guess, educated guess you're right, you can right now, you ask questions as you go and and we will be able to modify this after we get through this list. And I would just thank you, David. Um, very well spoken from, he's gone through this several times with us now. Um, one of, you know, we have four dates established for community conversations. There are my philosophy that I've recommended to the district is that we have some level of formation of a plan to discuss to the community at those forums. And at that same time, we're seeking feedback so that our plan gets modified. 
we've got all the parts and pieces. What we're asking this group is to put a preliminary idea together that we can then explore in four community forums over the next month and refine as we continue to go forward. So yes, it's hard. We got to start somewhere. I just, I still continue to struggle with what those forums are going to look like. And we're going to take things off the list now. Um, I have a lot of support and passion for the band program and the music program, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to shortchange sports. I mean, I, I, I just feel like we're going to, we're making decisions in a vacuum. Um, and if we take anything off the list, well, I think discussions we've had about Harrington and, and, the afternoon high school made sense but these kind of things i just i'm really have problems trying to decide that based on what we have right now and i'm watching the comments <laughs> from a couple other people that have joined and i mean, i don't i don't think i'm alone and i'm sure what amanda says and i think there's other people with the same concerns so this is todd mcdonald so please don't confuse when david started drawing those red lines through there because of those issues that when he's asking for opinion and voting on these other ones, that if we uh, if we get a certain feeling, he's crossing it off the list. He's try he's trying to get a sense of how people are feeling. So I could see Richard maybe where you're watching that behavior and you're thinking, okay, this is what's going to happen next. And so uh, that's not the intent. We're trying to get a straw poll from this group to to feel, you know, where where you're coming from and. Amanda, even, I think if you remember even months and months ago, like eight months ago, 10 months ago, we did talk a little bit about the schools. And I think instead of some of those high level, we even said, well, let's focus on the facility piece. And that's where some conversations went around equity. And that's where that new, right, the newer school kind of came out of that, talking about what is the differences between our different buildings. Right. So starting with that, and then you really have to then get into what happens in those buildings. Right. Well, what I guess, let me um, add to that and say, what more would you need? Richard, you, you use the words you're working in a vacuum. What more would you need? What else could be provided to you that would clarify this? So you asked, so I'm going to tell you, I mean, it would be a visioning process that included community members um, that was, would be something like assigning various weight to different things within the community and what we wanted to focus on. If we wanted to have a STEAM school um, focus, then obviously arts have to be a piece of that. Um, music has to be a piece of that. And, you know, hearing from Harrington parents and Gordon parents and, high school parents and all the all the different pieces i mean again we put the opportunity out there to do that we uh, listen to what they have to say then we've got some information to be able to to take back and at some point you have to limit the account the information you have and say we're going to go with this information but we haven't done surveys if i've missed them i'm sorry we haven't done you know surveys about these things we haven't done community meetings it just seems like we're going to narrow things more than what I would like to do before, before we give it to the community to look at. And, and I've, I've never been through this process before I came on the board after this had already been done. And so I'm just, this, this is my experience with this. So. I mean, is anyone else feeling this way or is this just, or am I the anomaly? Amanda, I'm kind of feeling that way as a parent and a teacher. I kind of like that we talked about Harrington and we made a decision on it, but it's kind of hard for me to vote and discuss instruments and uniforms and furniture without really knowing what each building needs and what kind of money we're putting into each building. Amanda, I can, I can tell you where kind of how I feel about it is uh, I feel like we're in the weeds on too many details. And as I put in the chat, I think, you know, you've got some individual stakeholders here that are kind of contributing to the discussion and you've got some, you know, that probably aren't, 
that are missing out. And, you know, and I think, I just don't think this is a, a sinking into the, this level of detail is really good for a large group like this. I mean, how many people do we have on this call? Uh, and, we're, and we're talking about, you know, individual um, line items. Um, I, I just have, I find that, I find that to be tough, tough to do. That's why the, that's why the discussion on, you know, the school was the easy one to make because it's a big vision item. It's not a, it's not, you know, do you, it's, it's simple. Do you do it or you don't? Uh, it's not, do you do it to what degree and how do you do it and how many square foot and do we have a pod system classroom? Do we have, you know, and, and we're in the, that little minutia now and we're, we're spending a lot of time, frankly, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not being negative on anybody in particular because this is a process that was kind of foisted upon the group, but um, we're spending a lot of time, I think, um, probably inadequately. I just feel unqualified to decide the vast majority of these things. Um, for me, I have no clue. I see the list of athletic things. It's a huge ticket, uh, you know, big ticket items. Um, and maybe they're essential, you know, partly from an educational point of view, but partly to, to you know, to get the bond to pass, everybody has to be touched. And I don't know to what extent that needs to happen to have a successful bond. You know, my priority is always gonna be on the educational things, the classroom. Um, and so I just, I don't know what to, to say about the athletics or the band and, you know, all these other things. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna jump in. And I've been, I've been involved in two different bonds, one in here in Marshall and one at, at Harper Creek. And the process is very similar to this. You have a large committee or a committee that, that is a various uh, wealth of knowledge. You uh, go, you have a uh, organization, architects, so forth. They go through and determine here are the things that need to happen at each of the buildings in order to get them to code or to get them to the educational needs that are equitable across the board. And then you look at some of the other things that are kind of like the wish list items, which may be Fall, might fall underneath the area of like the athletics. So the committee then goes through without necessarily community input at this point. The committee goes through and looks at those line items and based on the information that is shared during this committee forum, the conversation that happens within the committee, they kind of prioritize roughly what they think or what based on the knowledge that they have, what is of more of a priority or what is less of a priority with the partnership of the superintendent and in your architecture and so forth. Um, then you have community forums to go through and you share that information, several of these. Now, some of them have done you where you have individuals over at your house, which is difficult to do in this situation. You open up your buildings where they uh, people come into each of the elementaries in all locations and you go over, here are the things that we need to address, get some input from them, then that information is brought back to this committee and then it's ultimately refined. You're never going to please everybody because you have, you'll, you'll have uh, the athletic group, you'll have the music group, you'll have the, um, you'll have whatever community wants this versus the high school versus elementary. And that's what this group has to make a hard decision. And of course, there are politics involved. How do I balance that with ensuring everybody gets touched, as Mark pointed out, because that does need to happen. But you have to evaluate to what level and based on philosophy of the district, guidance from the superintendent and guidance from, um, well, you know, from, from what you're getting from the community. So I understand. I, I fully understand that, Dave. I know the yeah. process. I understand the process. I just don't like it. Yeah, I, I'm with you. <laughs> you know. And, and it's, I would, not, it's just not a, it's just not a good process. It it, it should be done differently, hmm. but um, you know it is what it is, I guess. But you know, again, we're working on uh, you know we'll probably time this is over probably a couple hours at least this week. And how many weeks are we doing this? And you know, you're you're and how many times? How many people? Um, you know, you're burning a lot of people's times on, on time on stuff that probably could have uh, come out to the broader group after it had already been vetted by. Uh, all the teaching and administrative and educational professionals 
uh, that that are that are part of this. So that's that's my that's my beef. And for me, I could do this easier as a survey where I have I could take my time work through rather than a meeting like this, um, mm -hmm. where I, I don't have time to study things. Uh, so I would be comfortable prioritizing things, knowing I'm just one voice of many, but it'd be way easier for me to do it in a survey format. Yes, Dave, that was what I was going to say. I was, as I listen to what people are saying, you know, if you can develop a survey for, you know, this group, at least that would give you, you know, insight into what people are thinking, uh, you know, whether it's good or bad, you know, in terms of the priorities, but that at least will give us the time to, you know, revisit some of the information that you sent us. And thank you for sending all of that. No, we didn't print everything out, but, uh, you know, at least information is there that some people did not have who may not have been in, but maybe putting together a survey and then analyzing the survey and bringing it back to us for our next meeting would be a step in the right direction. Hmm. I, so I, I like that idea, Vivian, and I also like, I, I know um, throughout this process, we have given surveys to teachers and, you know, we've asked for the, the wants and wishes list. Um, now with this information, which Brad's group has gone through and prioritized, you know, the physical aspects of the school, like what absolutely, you know, is necessary for the health of the building, I also wonder if administrators or teachers could go through and say, okay, you know, for, I'll, I'll take Hughes, for example, for Hughes, um, you know, what is priority one technology? Is it, you know, fixing the drinking fountains? Is it furniture? You know, if, if, if you had limited funds, which we do, what, mm -hmm what is your priority? Like what is number one for you in order to create an environment in which all of our children can serve, can, can thrive and, and, and be their best selves. So, so what is that? Um, and, and I think for me, that will be really, um, That'll be really informative. Now, obviously for sports and, and band, maybe that won't fit in, but I think that's important stuff that maybe we can wrestle with as a, as a bigger group or in the survey, but I, yeah, I'll be quiet. Very good. I appreciate all the input and uh, we will be um, obviously chatting with district uh, administration and seeing how we address your thoughts and figure out moving forward. I think we've covered uh, what I needed to cover tonight. Dr. Davis, is there anything else that you wish to cover? Well, I, I think the conversation has been really helpful. I think, um, you know, if everybody had this possible scope scenario available through a survey, as Mark was suggesting, and, um, Vivian said that, you know, this would be good for us to be able to go through and just visit this ourselves, put out what our priorities are. I like Amanda's suggestion that each of the buildings, the only thing is, Amanda, not every building had a, a significant amount of things um, on their list. And so, you know, we could ask them to go through that process. Um, we need to shortcut this um, to some degree because we have to get a recommendation that goes in front of the board um, and an idea of scope. And that is, that is the biggest challenge based on the timeline that we have here. You know, we're talking about starting to have, we have another meeting with this committee on the 6th of January. Um, and then shortly thereafter on the 9th, the board would like to start doing open work sessions with community input. And we have to shape what's going to be in front of people to consider. And, um, you know, visioning is one piece of it, but the other piece of that is what are some of the things that have popped up as areas that we want to start getting behind on a bond effort? 
And um, clearly, as Matt said, uh, you know, the feel good, easy selection is because it's visionary is new elementary school in, in Albion. Um, but there's a lot of other things on this on this list here that needs to be determined. Are we going to put our energies behind trying to get this in front of the community for, for their for their critique, their feedback, and their buy-in? Um, anything from, you know, it's easy to pick at athletics, but let's even look at like um, uh, Hughes Elementary courtyards, changing that building around to um, make the courtyards usable space in that building. Um, is that going to be a priority for this for this this uh, effort that we're going to bring back to the board of, board of education to consider? Um, so we have to get moving on this. I, I think the idea of a survey might be helpful. Uh, we can do that quickly. We can still do that over the holiday. Um, we can compile that information and communicate electronically out to committee members during the holiday for people to check your emails so that we can continue to move this agenda forward. Um, and ultimately the board's gonna have to decide, is this enough work, enough energy, enough ideas and enough um, support and passion behind it that we believe we can get this in front of the communities and get a bond moving. Um, you know, that decision has to be made from the board. So next steps, I'd say let's, let's fashion, let's take the possible scope scenarios, let's put that into a, you know, we'll send that out and people fill that in according to what you've known, what you've heard, the backdrop information that David's provided to you in regards to um, these items and why these are on the list. Um, let's get some feedback to them within a certain period of time so we can start compiling that and getting people to think about it during the holiday uh, um, winter break. David, are you, you okay with that? I mean, can we move forward in that direction? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about the survey. I, I'm i not sure. I, I, I would think that the, the information is out there already to be able, but maybe putting it into a format that you can check a box or something like that. Mm -hmm. is what you're looking for so we'll we'll take a look at that and, and discuss david i think all you have to do is convert this what you, the spreadsheet you're showing exactly. uh just to an online survey i think it'd be real yep. straightforward to do and just share it with the, whatever committee you know the the needs assessment committee at this point just to take our temperature on where where things stand sure of course with the opportunity to uh comment to make comments as well Very good. Okay, well, I think we've, uh, you've given us our homework and we have spent way, uh, we're way <laughs> over schedule <laughs> tonight. Um, so with that, I'm gonna say Merry Christmas to you all and have a wonderful holiday and we will be back in touch very soon. Thank you. Right. you too. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Dave. Hang Thank in there. This is important stuff. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We will have a working Christmas, but that's good. <laughs>